Word to Vec is a very popular feature engineering method for learning the embeddings of words for various applications. There are several variations of Word to Vec, such as the continuous bag of words as well as the skipgram model. In this video, we will discuss only the skipgram model of Word to Vec. Word to Vec computes the embeddings of words using sequential proximity in sentences. So Word to Vec computes embeddings that are somewhat sensitive to the linguistic structure of the data. So for example, if Paris is closely related to France, then Paris and France must occur together in small windows of sentences. And so their embeddings um, should also be somewhat similar. Th there are several variations of the word to work model. One of the variations is the continuous bag of words, which uses a context window and predicts the central word from the words which are available in the context window. The second popular model is a skipgram model, which predicts the words in the context window from the central word. So the prediction is the other way around. Now, in the book, I have discussed both the continuous bag of words model as well as the skipgram model. However, in this video, I will discuss only the skipgram model because of its greater popularity. Now, uh, in, in, in word to vec you have words and context. So, the idea really here is that you create these contextual windows, which are contiguous windows in sentences. So, you use a window of size t on either side of a word. And what you are doing is that you are trying to predict a window of size t on either side using a word. So, essentially, if, if, if you index the words in a sentences sequentially by the subscript, then what you're trying to do is that given the ith word, given the word wi, you're trying to predict wi minus t through wi minus 1 on the left side of the word and wi plus 1 uh, through wit given the ith word in the sentence. Now, uh, so, so the total number of words in the context window, including the t on either side, is given by m is equal to 2t. So one can create a D cross D word context matrix C with frequency Cij. And we want to find an embedding of, the, of each word. Now note that the moment that, that we see that we have a word context matrix C, it naturally makes us think of matrix factorization. And as we'll see later, word to vec is a form of weighted matrix factorization of this matrix. So where ha have, we, have we seen this setup before, elsewhere in machine learning? It turns out that this setup is very similar to recommender systems with implicit feedback. <coughs> now in recommender systems, you have user item matrices. Here, you have square word context matrices. But the shape of the matrix doesn't really matter. The nature of the matrix is quite similar. So in the case of... Uh, uh, our text application, the frequencies that correspond to the number of times a contextual word, that's a column ID, appears in a target window, that is a row ID. This is analog analogous to the number of units bought by a user, that's a row ID, uh, 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 which is a row ID uh, of an item, which is a column ID. Now, one unrecognized fact is that the skipgram word to vec model uses an almost identical model to current recommender systems with implicit feedback. So current recommender systems with implicit feedback, they use a technique called logistic matrix factorization. And as we will see, one of the variations of the skipgram model is actually a weighted form of logistic matrix factorization. Now, uh, since the nature of this architecture is very similar to the recommender system architecture, which I discussed in the previous lecture, uh, it would be helpful to watch the previous lecture on recommender systems with, uh, with row index to value autoencoders. So what's the neural architecture of the skipgram model? The neural architecture of the skipgram model, essentially it uses a hidden layer, so that you can see the hidden layer in the middle, and you have the one hot encoded word. That is the word that you are using to try to predict. That is x1 through xd, so it has d inputs, 
of which only one will be one. So D is the size of your lexicon and only one of these will take on the value of one depending on which word it is that is in the middle of the window and then you have a hidden layer the dimension of the hidden layer is p and that of course is a parameter for your neural network model and then uh, in the output layer since you're trying to predict uh, uh, 2m context words uh, sorry you're trying to predict m context words you are going to have m output sets so now each of these output sets have D output. So each of because each of them is a word. So for each of them, again, you're trying to predict uh, for each position which word it is. So the output contains M identical softmax word. Now note that these output weights are shared. So the same matrix V is used in each <coughs> of these M possibilities. So, so and because the same set of weights is used in each of the M possibilities, what you will have is that you will have exactly the same prediction for each of the set of M outputs. But of course, why do you really need M separate outputs if each of the output set is going to predict this, uh, the same probability? As it turns out, you can actually collapse it into a single output set. So what you can do is that rather than using M output sets, you can use a single output set and the D dimensional output vector in each context window. So they, so they are M answers. So, so as you see in the previous slide, you have M outputs because they are M answers corresponding to the M position in the context window. Now what you can do, you can really mini batch those words in a context window to achieve the same uh, effect. Now note that even here, when you're performing the training, what you're effectively doing by having these M identical outputs is really your mini batching over M training instances. You can actually treat each uh, input word uh, and target word as a single pair, and then you can simply mini batch them together. In fact, this particular way of mini batching has no particular significance. So in fact, what you can do is that you can sample from the context window. So you can have the central word and you can sample from the context window and you can use this architecture. It's almost the same. Now, one point is that is when you perform the gradient descent, that's performed with back propagation. Again, I am not discussing the gradient descent steps in detail here because we haven't discussed back propagation, but you can find them in the book. Uh, one problem with these gradient descent steps is that they are proportional to the size of the lexicon, the, num uh, the number of updates. And this is extremely expensive. So one change that you can uh, make is to the nature of the output layer. So, so there is another model which is called skipgram with negative sampling. Now, this model is actually not quite the same as the skipgram model. It uses a different objective function. In fact, the original word to vec paper, even though it provides a different objective function, it does not make it very clear that the neural architecture of the skipgram with negative sampling model is fundamentally different than the vanilla skipgram model. In this case, the neural arc, uh, remember that in the vanilla skipgram model, which we discussed in the previous slide, the output layer uses softmax probabilities to perform the prediction. Now, what you do is that you change the softmax to each unit you treat it independently, whether it's one or zero, and each of the outputs you treat it as a sigmoid unit. Okay, so now you have D little sigmoid units corresponding to D words in the lexicon. Now, one problem, of course, is that you still haven't solved your problem because now you, now you still have D outputs and if you were to train again, it will take the same amount of time. So, but the point really is that here is that what you can do is that you only keep the single positive output. Note that among the outputs, only one will be one and the other will be zeros and you sample K out of the remaining D minus one. The other outputs, they are assumed to be missing. You don't use them in back propagation. So where have we seen missing output before? Well, you can go back to the previous lecture and I have replicated the architecture here. Do you see the similarity between the two architectures? The upper one is word to vec The lower one is recommender system with, with missing uh, ratings. Now, <coughs> the, the only difference, the <coughs> only difference between the word to vec model and the architecture that we discussed in the previous lecture is that 
The word to vec model uses a sigmoid output layer with log loss. That is the only difference. Otherwise, the two architectures are almost identical. And the nature of this output is uh, uh, the, the reason you have this type of output in word to vec is because your outputs are binary. It makes more sense to have an output layer with logistic loss in that case. Here in the case of ratings, you have ratings which can be anywhere between one and five. So it's fine to use a linear layer. Now, <clears throat> so essentially what this means is that word to vec is nonlinear matrix factorization. In fact, in my book, I show this result for the first time. Uh, now, there is some work here. Levy and Goldberg actually showed an indirect relationship between word to vec SGNA, SGNS, and PPMI matrix factorization. And in the book, we provide a much more direct result. We show that word to vec is a weighted form of directly weighted form of direct logistic matrix factorization. And this is not surprising because of the similarity with the recommender system architecture. The other connection, which is very interesting, is that when you have recommender systems with binary data, that's implicit feedback data, you actually use logistic matrix factorization a lot. So, so, the, so the interesting point is that word to vec is closely connected to models that we already know in recommender systems. But neither the word to vec authors uh, nor the community have pointed out this direct connection. Now, uh, this general idea of row index to value autoencoder, this is very useful for any type of matrix to learn embeddings of either rows or columns. So, for example, we can apply uh, this idea to a graph adjacency matrix and it leads to node embeddings. And this idea has actually been used by DeepWalk and node to vec after indirectly enhancing the matrix entries with random walk methods. And again, uh, you can find some details of this of these graph embedding methods in the book.